Tonight I want to speak about entering emptiness and looking at it from the point of view of one of the perennial problems that pops up for meditators, the, the problem of time and progress versus presence and intimacy. The problem of, of progress is something that besets every meditator and it's bound up with the problem of time. We want to make progress. We want to get better at it. We want to have better experiences and so on. And of course we fear that we don't. In fact, sometimes we fear that we're getting worse rather than better. So we're sliding backwards rather than heading forward. And this whole way of relating to the meditation practice is bound up, of course, with time. Because you can't have progress unless you have time. You have to have time in which to progress. And progress takes time, slowly, slowly, step by step. But on the other hand, the basic practice is to be present to what is happening now. So to surrender to what is happening now. And that implies no time and therefore no progress and no regress either, neither getting worse nor getting better. So it's like there's this conflict going on, there's this contradiction between these projects. When we uh, try to be present, what we usually discover is that our relationship or our experience of the present, of this which is happening right now, is polluted by our, our, our determination to make something out of it, to get something from it. You know, people frequently talk about getting something from the retreat. It was a good retreat, I really got a lot from it. What we're, going, what we're trying to get is something which will benefit me and confirm me in my sense of who I think I am or who I want to be or who I don't want to be. So my experience of this, this right now, is usually for something. Something which is beyond this experience. This basic, set, this basic approach that I have to experience of what's in it for me. And when I approach experience in this way, then this experience right now isn't just what it is. I experience it as being for something. And this something is something else, which hasn't arrived yet. So it's like there's something in this experience which is pointing toward the future. And what it points to is something which will somehow complete it and justify it and somehow make me okay and justify me. And there's this, there's this restlessness in this relationship which prevents me from actually settling completely with the experience right now. So let's take a very mundane example. Let's say the experience of the breathing. Sitting here in the hall experiencing the breathing. Even when I'm completely immersed in it, I have this sense that I'm experiencing the breathing for something, for the purpose, say, of developing concentration. I want to get concentrated. I want to, I want to get good concentration. I don't want to have to be bothered by thoughts, by distractions, and so on and so forth. 
my experience is not simply breathing, it's breathing for something. And this something here is my image of what it would be like to be fully concentrated, completely present, no distractions, no disturbances. So I have an image, an idea of concentration. And this is what my experience of breathing is pointing toward. This is what gives my experience of breathing its meaning, its significance. And on the basis of this image, I am judging this experience of breathing as being either adequate or inadequate, improving, getting worse, still the same, whatever. And of course, mixed up in this is this background image of who I am and who I should be. Certainly I should not be who I am now because it's not good enough yet. But you know, later on, if things work out okay, then I will be good enough. There's this constant judgment of the experience and a constant manipulation of it in a direction which has as its basic purpose to confirm me that I'm okay now. I'll be, I'm all right. I'm a, a good meditator. I'm on the path to enlightenment or I've solved my problem. I'm struggling to become intimate with the present moment, just to be present, but I'm constantly sabotaged by my preoccupation with the inadequacy of what's happening now. And my sense of my goal, which by its very nature can only be attained or realized sometime in the future. And this is, this is in the very nature of a goal. A goal, by its very nature, is not happening now. It's, it's, it's always something which will happen sometime in the future. It's never happening now. What's happening now is never good enough. And I'm always, in my relationship to what's happening now, I'm either waiting for something better to turn up or I'm trying to make something happen. I'm getting in there and, and really trying to grab hold of it and, and squeeze it, squeeze something out of it. But rega regardless, if I'm waiting for something else to, to turn up in the future, or if I'm getting right in there and trying to make it happen, still, I'm not being intimate with what is happening right now. I'm getting in the way. I'm sabotaging the whole project. All we have is this moment. That's all we ever have had, and it's all we ever will have. But when we're caught in time, we find we're never really totally available for now because we're, we're constantly being limited and held back by our images of the future and, of course, of the past. It used to be like this for me. What if it is like, again? I don't want it like it used to be. I want it some other way in the future. And the more real these images are, the more I'm prevented from being fully intimate with what's happening right now. So we have a problem in terms of our relationship to time. And, and a, this problem revolves around our desire for progress and our fear of regress. And this um, relationship to time has a lot to do with our relationship with effort. 
the effort that we make in the meditation practice. When we have a, a, a feeling of a sense of lack, of something missing, of something inadequate, then we strive to get it. We strive to, to, to fill in the gap, to make things good enough, to make myself good enough. We, we struggle to make something happen. And what we want to happen hasn't happened yet. This is the nature of the goal. It's always in the future. So it still hasn't happened. Maybe I'm getting a bit closer, but still it hasn't happened. It must be, if, since it haven't, hasn't happened yet, that I'm not making enough effort. So I've got to make more effort. And I have to try harder. We try harder and harder and we strain and at some point of course we can't sustain it. It becomes impossible to sustain. So we collapse back in exhaustion and you know, take a break, recover and then come back into the arena and try again and struggle except that it's still not happening. Maybe it was because I took that break. I should never have taken that break. So I'm, I'm feeling guilty about that, but I, I battle onwards. And eventually it just becomes too much and I just collapse back and I have to take a break. So I get into this, this pattern of strive, collapse, strive, collapse, strive, collapse. And it just, it's, it just goes on forever because what I'm, what I'm seeking hasn't arrived yet. It's still not here. I keep going around in, the, in, in cycles or I just give up because it's, it's just too difficult. I can't do it. Other people can do it, but I can't do it. It's too hard for me. Maybe I come back later on and give it another, another go. But it's like meditation becomes this dreary chore, this, this battle that I'm constantly fighting against myself. And what we're battling is those aspects of ourselves that we fear are not good enough for the project. Other people can make the right kind of effort, but I can't. Other people have that kind of sharp mind, but I don't. Other people can stop thinking when they want to, but I can't, and so on. And this, this sense of a battle, of a struggle, is always associated with the sense of something to be gained, something to be won, sometime in the future. And again, it's that image of a future result which is out there. And this goal that we have is only an image. It can only be an image an idea. Maybe it's not even sufficiently well formed to be a coherent idea, but it's this sense of something, something better than what's happening now, someone better than who I am now. And as long as this image has power over me, I am disconnected with what's actually happening now. And this, this sense of a goal, when I look at it, of course, it's all part of the self, of the, of the image of the self, because that image that I have of the final victory, when, I, when it's finally got there, I can finally say, right, I've done it. I've figured out this meditation. I've done it. What is that image? It's an image of me finally arrived, finally good enough, finally okay now. In other words, it's an image of the self, perfected. Our obsession with a goal and with progress is all part of our obsession with the self. 
as long as we have this obsession with the self, then we have time, and we have war, we have victory and defeat, we have striving and exhaustion, and we have a failure to fully surrender to what's actually happening right now. Certainly when, when we treat the meditation practice as, as a war, as a battle, then we lose sight of our sense of play. Play is, is very important in meditation practice. By play I mean the practice of this moment for its own sake. The practice of this moment not for the sake of anything else not for the sake of anything which might come later to justify it, but simply for its own sake, for what it is now. And this is a sense of total intimacy with this experience right now, without feeling any need to add to it or to gain anything from it, but just as it is. And of course, when, when we do actually play, when we're playing games, that's what we have. It's like when we're in the game, we're just playing the game. And in the moment of complete play, there is no winning and losing. It's just the play. It's just the game. And this, this play is, is intimacy, being intimate with the experience as it is right now. And this is not something that we can add to our agenda. This is not something that we can plan for sometime in the future because it can only happen now. It can't happen sometime in the future. And it's not even something that we can do because if we're doing it, then there's someone here, the self, who's doing it and that self as a project, an agenda, something he or she is trying to get out of this, something which will happen sometime in the future. What we're looking for in the practice of presence is to be simply and, and fully intimate with what's happening without reference to anything else. But we can't do that as long as there's someone here is trying to be fully intimate with the present. And this is the, the, the paradox that we're, we're faced with. When we're doing it, when we're in there with our agenda, doing the meditation, then no matter how well it's going, there's always this background feeling of someone here who's doing this and who is experiencing this. And this is what the Buddha calls the conceit I am. The conceit I am is this background, vague sense of someone here. It's not, it's not specific. That's why it's called I am. It's general, but it has a kind of a seething, energetic, quality to it. Sometimes we sense it or we, we see it in operation when, let's say, I'm really with the meditation practice, I'm really totally with it, and I've lost sense of time, and there's either no thought or very little thought, and certainly what little thought there is is not getting in the way, so it's kind of floating around at the edges, and I'm really right with it, and then I notice that I'm really right with it. And then suddenly there's this urge, this incredibly powerful urge to think about it. And the thinking erupts and it breaks out. Often with a commentary. Oh, wow, I'm really doing this. <laughs> and, of course, with that thought, up comes the self. I'm the one who's doing this. 
this is me. It's finally working. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. But what's, what's interesting here is the power of that thought. The, the energy of it. That it is determined to come up. And it just won't be stopped. Before that thought comes up, there's that, it's like a, this kind of seething movement underneath the carpet. And there's this background sense of someone here experiencing something, but it's nothing specific. The thought that comes up makes it specific. Ah, oh, I've done it. I'm, I'm the meditator. I'm, I'm great. I've, I'm the one who's finally cracked this one. I'm on the way now. I'm making progress. So this is what the Buddha calls the movement from the conceit, I am, to I am this, which characterizes that movement from the conceit I am to self. Self is always, for the Buddha, specific. It's always I am this. This is who I am. I'm the good person. I'm the bad person. I'm the successful meditator. I'm the hopeless joke. You know, I'm the bored one. I'm the satisfied one. I'm the one who's getting up now. It's always very specific. Even when that goes, still there's this background sense, I am, dot, dot, dot. And it's like there's this, this waiting for the opportunity to move out and in some way identify with something and so it can, we can sense, I am this. This is who I am. And of course we can see this in the narratives. This is what we're doing all the time. Seizing upon the narrative to identify with. This is, now I know who I am. I'm the person in this narrative. I thought I was the person in the last narrative, but now I can see that I'm the person in this narrative. So the self is constantly arising and, and creating itself. Often we, we see it as the commentator, the, the one who is absolutely determined to give a pass a judgment on the experience. We talk sometimes about the witness. Well, sitting in the witness box is the commentator. And the commentator likes to explain to the witness what's going on. <laughs> and it's the commentator who, who creates the self. This is who I am. And the power of it is enormous. It's huge. The, the more we settle down, the more we can sense the power of this that's underneath. True intimacy arises when the self disappears. But th what this means is that, it, that true intimacy is not something that can be done because the self is the doer. The self is the project manager, the one in charge. What we want is to be intimate with the experience. We feel separate. So the project manager comes in and having established the agenda then works out the strategy to manipulate the experience to attain complete intimacy. But of course it's the project manager who's getting in the way. And this is the self. It's the, it's the project manager, it's the controller She's the one who has to be dissolved into emptiness. When the Buddha talks about this, one way that he talks about it is <coughs> in terms of emptiness and the entry into emptiness. This word emptiness, of course, is one of the key terms in Buddhist teaching and it's used in different ways in different traditions. When the Buddha talks about emptiness, what he's referring to is absence something not here. This situation is empty to the degree that things aren't here. So, for example, here in this hall and in this building, there's a very quiet, very peaceful and powerful atmosphere. There is not the kind of distracted noise and rushing around that we would associate with 
downtown Perth. So this situation is empty of the noise, the bustle, the distraction of downtown Perth. Emptiness refers to absence. The more that disappears, the more empty the situation is. Ultimately, the Buddha says, emptiness refers to the absence of the self. The Buddha says, the world is said to be empty because it is empty of self and of what belongs to self. He, he was asked why is it uh, that the world is said to be empty? And his answer is, the world is said to be empty because it's empty of self and what belongs to self. You notice how self and possession go, go along together. The two movements of self are identification and possession. And possession always implies control. Possession is meaningless without control. So, this is my meditation. How's your meditation going? Oh, it's, my meditation is going really badly. Or it's going really well. But what meaning does it have to claim to own something, to possess something, if we have no control over it? It's meaningless. So we're constantly trying to assert control. This is the, the possession aspect and the identification aspect, I am this. The Buddha is saying that the world is already empty of self and what belongs to self. Emptiness is not something to be attained. It's already happening. The world is already empty of self and what belongs to self. There isn't a self and there never was one. We're determined to think there is. In fact, we're determined to think one into existence. But she actually, she's not here and she never was here. So the Buddha is saying that what we take to be self is not. We, of course, create an identity. And we have to create an identity, otherwise we couldn't function. What we are, our, ourselves, is this temporary, emergent property. It's a temporary construction that we, we hastily put together, hoping that it'll, it'll do the job for the time being. And then we have to patch it up for the, uh, in the next minute, so it'll function then, and then patch it up again and keep doing it. It's, the self is a project that we're constantly working on that's never finished. It's like the um, do-it-yourself handyman doing the renovations. It just goes on and on and on and on and never quite gets finished. But we take it to be fixed, permanent, existing somehow independently and of absolutely tremendous importance. We fail to see that it's fluid, constantly shifting, ceaselessly being replaced, and while useful, by no means the most important thing around. So we get stuck in our images of ourself. We take our image of ourself to be of tremendous importance. And since the self is, functions largely as an image, we, ta we take images to be real. We have images of past and future and we take them to be real. We take them to be more real than what's actually happening right now. We judge what's happening right now on the basis of whether they, f they fit in with our images of past and future. Why do these images have such power? I mean, it's obvious when you think about it that they're not real. So why do they have such power? It's because the self, our assumption of our own reality, of our own fixed, permanent nature, requires time. If these images of past and future are not real, then that means I'm not real. And if I'm not real, that means that I'm not as important as I thought I was. And that can't be true. So 
we've got a lot invested in our images of past and future. We've got a lot invested in our ideas of progress. But what the Buddha is saying is that this sense of ourselves that we have and this sense of the world that we inhabit is actually false. It's just not like that at all. It's quite different. It's empty. Now, the flip side of emptiness, which is essentially absence of, of what's not here, the flip side of emptiness is presence. If the world is empty of self and of what belongs to self, okay, so that's not there, so what is there? What's actually happening? And of course, it's this is what we've been work we work on in the meditation practice. We're constantly working to identify, well, what is here? And trying to be as precise as possible with it and trying not to bring, not to drag in our assumptions from past and future to pollute the experience. What is this now? And can I experience it without dragging in associations from the past or anticipations from the future? Can I see it for what it is, just as it is now, with nothing else added? As soon as the self steps in, then we can't. We have to drag in past and future. I recognize this. This is what used to happen to me. Or I can, I can recognize this. This is not what I want in the future. We keep polluting the experience by dragging in past and future. When the Buddha is talking about this, he describes the practitioner contemplating a field of perception as empty of self and what belongs to self. And he says, in this way she regards it as empty of what is not there, but what remains she understands in this way. This is. This is her genuine, undistorted, pure entry into emptiness. So, we recognize what isn't here. What isn't here is self and what belongs to self, the, cons the projects, the agendas, and so on. But what remains, she understands in this way, this is. Now, this expression, this is, it's quite interesting. First of all, it's, again, specific. This is. Now remember when the Buddha is talking about the self, he's, he says, again, he's very specific. But there he adds to it. He says, this is myself. But here it's just, this is. There's no myself added. And what he seems to be trying to communicate is he's trying to communicate what it's like to be completely intimate with exactly what is happening without anything extra added to it. It seems to me that what we're talking about is intimacy, complete intimacy with this now. And it's radically simple. It's just what it is. One term that the Buddha uses to talk about it is tatata, suchness, is a normal translation. Um, if you read, in particular, uh, Mahayana literature, sometimes they talk about suchness. The term literally means just thisness. It's just thisness turned into an abstract noun. So suchness, thus just thisness, intimacy. I remember being taught about this when I was in southern Thailand. I used to, I spent some time at a place called Wat Swan Mok, which was the 
monastery of Ajahn Buddhadasa, one of the great um, teachers of 20th century Thai Buddhism. The first time I went there, which I I think was in 1982, he, he died of some, some years ago, but he had a, um, a forest monastery, which is, was, when he was young, he just, as a young monk, went into the forest in southern Thailand and set up camp. And then over the years, people came to join him. And so this particular piece of forest became this forest monastery. So it was just a hill covered in, in tropical rainforest. But of course, as Thailand developed over the, over the decades, most of the, rain, most of the forests got chopped down. And so Buddhadasa built a wall around this particular spread of forest. And inside that wall, his monastery, the forest remains. And outside, it's all being developed. When I first went there in 1982, the, 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 the foreigners program consisted of three people. I was the third. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just basically you, you wandered in and someone would show you to a hut in the forest and then, okay, I suppose you should meditate now. And off you go. And I kept going back there over the years and, and he, he became increasingly popular. And at one point he would have dozens of people, up to, maybe up to a hundred at a time. Uh, and the, the, the monastery was running a, 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 a meditation retreat every month. And in some of these retreats, Buddhadasa would, would actually give the Dharma talks. He was a great scholar, as well as a great practitioner. And he used to like giving Dharma talks about esoteric aspects of Buddhist philosophy, like, for example, Tata Ta. So he was explaining this, this highly advanced esoteric aspect of Buddhist philosophy, Tata Ta. And as it happened, this particular retreat was being held in the wet season. And if you've ever been in a tropical rainforest in the wet season, well, first of all, it's wet. It's very wet. There's lots of trees and leaves and vegetation of various forms. And the whole place is seething with life. In this monastery, because it wasn't set up as a meditation centre, so, um, you know, the meditation hall was actually an old scout camp, disused scout camp hall. Uh, and then everything was separated. The hall was in one section of the monastery. Accommodation was in another section. Toilets and showers were in another section. The hall where you had the Dharma talks was in another part. The dining area was in another part. And so during this retreat, you'd be constantly sludging through the mud and the rain to get from one place to another, to another, to another, to another, to another, endlessly. And the, the talks were given in this enormous, Bought, it's called in Thai, um, Dharma Hall, built of, it looked very nice, but it was built of concrete. And so you have, have a, everybody sitting on a bare concrete floor, but because they know that the, the Western meditators are a bit soft, they gave them something to sit on, Hessian bags, <laughs> which, which were rather sodden <laughs> with all that humidity. So we're sitting on, this, on these Hessian bags on this concrete floor, and Ajahn Buddhadasa was sitting on this elaborate Dharma throne, high above us, giving us these talks, which are being translated from the Thai. And he was talking about, in this particular instant, ta-ta-ta, suchness, just thisness. And he was explaining to us what we already knew, which was, it's raining. <laughs> and he said, you think that's bad, because you're spending all day sludging around in the mud and the wet, from here to there. Well, on the other side of this hill, there are rice farmers who are dancing for joy in this rain because now they know they can feed their families for another year. You think the rain is bad. They think the rain is good. You're both wrong. The rain is wet. <laughs> and that's ta-ta-ta. That's suchness. That's the, one of the ultimate Buddhist teachings. That's the entry into emptiness. The rain is wet. This hall is cold. That's all. <laughs> it's not bad that it's cold. It's not good that it's cold. It's not, why don't they fix it up when it's cold? It's not, if only the heaters didn't make such a racket. 
It's just cold. That's all. It's just this. And this is suchness, just thisness. And this is what's actually present. It's this. But we're never satisfied with this. We're either trying to turn it into something else, or we're judging it for not being good enough, or comparing it with something else, or wondering why it's not something else, or whatever. And this is our habit, and it's a habit that is bound up with our relationship to time. And with time comes success and failure and us struggling to get rid of one and get to the other. This whole issue of time is 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 really interesting also in the in in the traditions themselves, the way that the meditation practice is is taught and, and spoken about and the, the very idea of what one is doing in the meditation practice. And you get different relationships in in the different traditions. Um, and this was pointed out to me a few years ago now by a uh, Zen teacher, Hogan Sun, who lives in Byron Bay. I think he still lives in Byron Bay. A very impressive Zen teacher, uh, very low key. Runs retreats in the North Coast and the Brisbane area, I think. But he's uh, Soto Zen. And in Soto Zen, they practice Shikantaza, which is the, the, the kind of practice taught by Dogen Zenji in the 13th century in Japan. And I've spent some time practicing Zen, and I'm a particular fan of Dogen Zenji. And I feel that Dogen's Shikantaza is essentially the same as the Theravada insight meditation. And I've had several conversations with Hogan about this. And generally, we, we cheerfully agree with each other. But the last, the last time we are having a conversation about this, I was talking about how, in the Mahasi approach, the emphasis on teaching a continuity of mindfulness over time, and, and how important this is. And, and I gave as an, as, as, as an example one of my main teacher, Saido Upandita, one of his little um, tricks that he would use in interview. Let's say you would come into meditation interview and you would report your meditation experience. And let's say you, you, you reported a particularly good experience. You were really impeccably mindful, really tr tr tracking the, the experience. And sometimes he would say, what happened next? And you would say, oh, well, bloody, bloody, bloody. And he would say, what happened next? And you would say, oh, blah, 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 blah. And he would say, what happened next? And of course, at some point, you would have to say, I don't know. And then he would say, please, be more mindful <laughs> and throw you out. <laughs> so it was his way of finding the gaps, you know, pointing them out for you. So I started telling this story to, to Hogan. And I got as far as the first time Upandita says, what happened next? And Hogan just couldn't restrain himself. And he said, no next, <laughs> just this. <laughs> 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 and that, of course, that's his whole trip, what he, what he teaches. It's, his whole thing is no next, just this. And he, just, he, he, he pushes it and talks about it and so on all of the time. Uh, there's no progress over time. There's just this. There's nothing to get. It's just this. There's nothing to lose. It's just this. And so in, in, in Zen, they particularly emphasize this, this, this approach, whereas in Theravada, but of course they acknowledge the fact of, pro of progress over time. 
but it's quite quietly slid under the table. <laughs> in, in Theravada, the emphasis tends to be on progress over time, but there's also the teaching of just this. So you get different balances from the different traditions. Because all of them are faced with this problem. If there's time, then there's progress. But if there's time, there's no intimacy. And if there's no intimacy, there's no progress. <laughs> so, how do we deal with this? One way that the Buddha talks about this is he talks about the, how the self is always localized. It's always, it always has a place. I say, my body. My body has a location intimately experienced by me, within me, inside me. There's nothing closer to me than my body. My lover. It's that body, very close to mine, but further away. Those people over there, even further away. Those people on the other side of the planet. The, the closer the location, the greater the identification. Me, my body. If it hurts, it really hurts. My lover's body, if that hurts, it's painful, but not as painful as my body. My friends over there, oh yeah, that's very sad. Those people on the other side of the planet, who? The self is always localized. And the Buddha talks about consciousness itself being localized, being established or supported at a particular location. So, for example, here in this body. And where it locates itself, where it lands, that's where, where it identifies. This is me. And from here, this is my world. And, but then he talks about, what if you had a consciousness which was unlanded or unsupported? Apatitita vinyana in Pali. And this is the, the image that he gives to talk about it. Suppose there was a house or hall with a peaked roof with windows to the north, the south and the east. When light enters a window at sunrise, where would it land? On the western wall, Bhante. If there was no western wall, where would it land? On the earth, Bhante. If there was no earth, where would it land? On the water, Bhante. Ancient Indian cosmology, underneath the earth is water. If there was no water, where would it land? It would not land, Bhante. So the image is light. Light hits something. Now we have the expression to see the light. Actually we don't see light. What we see is what light hits. What if you have light but it doesn't hit anything? What could you say about it? What if you have a consciousness that doesn't, doesn't land anywhere? What if there's a consciousness which is not localized anywhere? What can be said about it? And what would it be like to live with such a consciousness? To live with unlanded consciousness? The feel of it must be one of total unrestricted freedom, of the absence of limitation. In the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha talks about the mature practitioner 
quite living independently, not clinging to anything in the world. Living independently, without dependence. Not stuck, not landed on anything at all. And this is the freedom that the practice points towards. But this freedom comes from complete intimacy with this, which is present now, without getting it tangled up with past and future, with ownership and possession and identification and progress and regress and good and bad and wanting and disliking and, and, and all the whole, the whole package that comes along with it. Now this, this freedom, whatever it is, comes about through an intimate awareness of what is present. Uh, Dogen Zenji says, when you see or hear fully engaging body and mind, you grasp things directly. And this is his approach to, to the practice. When you see or hear, or any other sense, fully engaging body and mind. And you can see in the practice that this full engagement of body and mind is, what's con is what is always being called for. It may be something as ordinary as sitting in an armchair in this hall. But to sit in this armchair fully engaging body and mind, to get up and walk out and go to the dining room, fully engaging body and mind. This is the, uh, the challenge of the practice. When you see or hear fully engaging body and mind, you grasp things directly. And this is that, that direct, intimate connection with what's going on. This um, practice of intimacy requires, to begin with, a total engagement with what's going on in the present. We have to be fully committed to the present and have a real sense, of, a real passion and commitment to what is happening now. And this, this passion and commitment is something that we, we are not familiar with. We rarely experience it. Because every time we lose ourselves in fantasies about the future or regrets about the past. In the moment that we lose ourselves in those thoughts, in that moment we throw away that passion and commitment. It cannot survive the fantasy. We need a felt intimacy with what is new. In other words, an ability to see the freshness of things, to recognize that this situation now, no matter how familiar and no matter how mundane, is actually completely new. It's never happened before. It will never happen again. And this is simply a fact. A total surrender to this situation as it is now regardless of how it seems to us, regardless of whether or not it fits into our agenda, regardless of whether or not it fits into our image of ourselves, but a willingness to completely surrender to what's happening. And this includes, of course, faith, which we haven't talked about on the retreat. In the practice, and in fact, in our ordinary life. We live on the border between the known and the not yet known. We're constantly moving from an experienced present into stepping into an unknown future. We don't know what's going to happen next. And sometimes that creates fear. But we have to be willing to step into the darkness, to step into the abyss, into what we don't know. We don't know what we're stepping into. And to make that step requires faith. 
and it requires wisdom. We don't know what we're stepping into, but the step that we are taking now is illuminated by our awareness. We can be present to this step, even though we're moving into the complete unknown. So there's the awareness, the mindfulness, in the present and the faith to step into the unknown. And finally, it, this intimacy requires a willingness to be surprised, a willingness to be jolted out of our normal project mentality and to be open to the fact that the, the future is genuinely unknown. And so what will happen or something will happen that will completely surprise us. And we can see how it's often the case that insight when it arises comes as a surprise. It's unexpected. Suddenly, oh, there it is. And this willingness to surprise entails a willingness to let go of the future. We talk about having to let go of the past. Letting go of the past is comparatively easy because much of it we would much rather not see again. But letting go of the future, that's much harder because the future is the image that I hold of the new improved me, the me who is finally good enough. But I have to be willing to let go of that as well. When I can let go of the future, which is, after all, only an image, then I can have this readiness to be surprised by whatever may happen next. And when I'm ready to be surprised, then I'm genuinely open to the possibility, the possibility of, of intimacy, of being completely intimate. Okay, that's enough for tonight. Thank you. <laughs>